And uh, I want to invite, I want to, I want to welcome everybody this morning to uh, an awesome presentation. I've been really looking forward to hearing this. Um, you know, data is becoming more important for us, and I'm so happy that Julie from Blackburn Labs, uh, they're a member of Tech Collective along with husband Rob. Um, they're speakers um, of, of, of renown, and uh, we're happy to have them here. First, I just want to tell you a little bit about how Tech Collective has pivoted over the last several weeks. Uh, we are we are typically and primarily we've been an in-person type of organization for the 20 years or so of our existence. And we've always kind of seen the future of uh, using video and being able to archive presentations like these and panel discussions so that we could uh, use them for our members later on. And you know, the last four or five weeks, we've been working from home actually since early March. We as an organization started working from home and started experimenting with these tools. We're still learning. We're open to ideas. You know, this uh, most of our presentations go pretty smooth, but occasionally there's something going on. So I said to be patient as we try to figure things out. We would love your advice if you have some. We just signed a contract with Cisco, so we have WebEx as well. We're working on trying to learn that tool, and I think eventually we'll figure out which tool makes sense for which types of gatherings, you know. So um, there's two important areas that we've pivoted over the last few weeks. Um, first of all, People that are home that are uh, now remote from their their coworkers and their vendors and their customers um, and their work community at large are learning are yearning to uh, connect and to learn. Um, there's a, a lot of isolation, even though with our families, there's a lot of isolation. I think the tech collective can serve to kind of uh, be a platform where people can come together uh, to learn, to connect, to just hang out together. Sometimes, you know, we had a call earlier this morning. In preparation for this, it was just great connecting with people and you know, in sharing stories about how everybody's getting through this. So, learning and connecting is one area that we're uh, we're pivoting towards. We took our list of uh, in-person meetings that we were planning on having for the next several months or a year, and we're pivoting that to uh, shorter, digestible bites that people can uh, hear, you know, in like an hour or less. Um, the two of the big learning things were more people come online. But their attention, their kind of their digital span of attention is a little bit shorter. Their virtual span of attention is a little bit shorter. So um, we have a really nice amount of uh, content today. Happy to have uh, Julie here. Julie is uh, a data scientist educated at Harvard, uh, a certified scrum master. She has been featured in uh, Providence Business Journal, also in, an, uh, in a magazine called Clutch as an AI company. Um, with a focus on AI. We're really privileged to have her to be able to talk to us about this topic today and uh, so happy you could join us, Julia. Let me turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that warm, warm introduction. I feel so fancy. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, we're going to discuss data as a narrative today because if you can't tell your story effectively with data, then you can't really drive action. That's where a lot of people run into trouble. We're going to uh, review the big issue, go into sort of the humanities element of telling data as a story, and uh, then I'm going to give some real-time examples with some visualizations too, with uh, examples of how the stories can coincide with them. Behold, my strategically lit headshot, and uh, as uh, Mr. Devine already did, he uh, outlined a few of my um, accolades, but suffice to say I'm an expert in this field. I've, I've at least really tried to be so. Uh, once again, what is a data narrative? Data narrative is essentially a written summary of a set of data that draws conclusions and makes comparisons to explain the meaning of data in detail. Uh, we are going to go through what stumbling blocks companies run into when they're trying to drive that data-driven culture and uh, look at some sobering stats in regard to that. We're going to go into the exponential nature of communication complexity. I'm going to show you seven ways to look at data as a story. We'll untangle some intersections uh, and, and do a lot there. And uh, I will always keep people, I will always keep reminding people a data driven culture starts with you. We're going to talk about establishing trust and how to poke some holes in logic. So this is. Um, important. <laughs> Basically, no story, so what? The harsh reality. Uh, the new Vantage Partners has a big uh, data and AI executive survey. This is for 64 large organizations, uh, and they interview C 
C-level technology business executives and leaders. And what they were finding is that 72% of the survey participants report that they have yet to forge a data-driven culture. And these are big companies. I only have a few logos here, but this also includes CVS Health, Ford, uh, in addition to Johnson & Johnson, Schneider Electric. Yeah, like I said, it was 64 organizations. And I also looked at the Harvard Business Review because they did a follow-up luncheon with these organizations. And it, it wasn't for lack of task forces. It wasn't for lack of funding or spending to try to create that da data-driven culture. So, so what's the missing link? And what can be challenging here is we're looking at what the potential problem is all of these companies were really large. So is there in a larger company a communication breakdown? Are they less nimble? Let's let's take a look at that, right? So I love this quote from Daniel Webster, uh, communication is key. Of all my possessions, if they were taken from me, with one exception, I would choose to keep the power of communication. For by it, I would soon regain all the rest. And uh, I find that really, really powerful and, and true to me um, for if I had all of my talents stripped away, what would I keep? I would keep communication. So we're going to look at the exponential nature of the complexity of communication. And I think because I'm also a certified scrum master and they say, don't go past nine members on a team. It's a problem. It's going to be very, very clear really soon as we go through a couple of slides here. So think of it this way, communication, single person project, one channel or, or you know, just to yourself, I suppose, so really zero. So then a two per person project, you have A to B and B back to A. So you can see the channels there. Now we add one more person. Now we're up to six channels of communication, A to B, A to C, B to A, B to C, C to B, C to A. Huh getting quite pretty big. We added one lousy more person, a four person project. There are 12 channels of communication. Look at all of that. It really adds up. Now, if you want to check out the formula of how to do it yourself, there it is. But also how I mentioned with Scrum, we try not to go past nine. There are 72 communication channels with a nine person team. So larger teams add more communication channels and exponentials and the bigger the team the more important it is to have your clear communication i once dealt with a project where i was actually selling a house and there were six siblings involved with the sale of the house and they all had wives or husbands and they all wanted to be involved with the communication so i was dealing with 12 people and all those 12 people communicating with each other too so what ended up happening was it ended up stripping down the humanity a little bit because I had to do everything in a spreadsheet just to make sure we were all looking at the same facts and figures and not breaking down in that communication to make sure they all knew exactly what was going on, when it was shown, what the feedback was, where we should go, what the market was doing, and so forth. And you didn't want it to break down, but at the same time, what was lost there, that personal touch, that one-on-one -on -one phone conversation because there were just too many to keep up with. So what you're missing with that is brain engagement. And I'm going to soon talk about the science behind storytelling and what your brain actually does, right? So when you tell a story, you get better memory retention and recall. Your personal connection and relatability is stronger. You have increased attention. It helps keep your audience focused, happy. And emotions are what really drive action, okay? So now here is the brain on logic, which is fine. <laughs> you know, you're firing up two communication regions, language processing and language comprehension, right? However, storytelling, whoa, look at your brain light up, right? You not only have language processing and language comprehension, but your imagination is filling in the rest. So you're thinking about touch, you're thinking about colors and shapes, movement, uh, sounds, you're, you're really filling it in. I mean, imagine if you said next year we will produce more diodes than grains of rice as a culture. That's, that gives you an image. You can see those grains of rice in your hand and it gives you an idea for the vastness, right? Just by phrasing it in a more story form, right? These are why TED Talks can go viral. 
these are why these are the reasons why stories and fairy tales told to children that were crafted hundreds of years ago they're still learning and imagining with them today stories fire up the brain yeah more effectively than just raw stats i'm gonna talk a little bit more about the humanities in the crafting of storytelling before we get into some uh, data visualization data visualization examples and i'll give you examples of how to use stories with those uh, data metric. Okay. Now, uh, emotional hooks in storytelling pathos that appeals to your emotion. Now it doesn't just have to be happiness. It could be a righteous anger. It could be humor, right? Now that encourages sharing and retelling the story. And it's really easy for the audience to engage with when you can pluck those heartstrings in a good or a, or a uh, effective way, right? Cause righteous anger can be effective too. Anger is, is a great driver. And uh, if you think of stories that are shared on social media, they usually do have that emotional hook, right? What's challenging about them is it can be a little more difficult to make the data stand out and it can encourage that feedback loop bias or people talking in more terms of a case study instead of a real analysis. Uh, logos is another way to hook in the emotions in a story because you're appealing to their intellect. However, this is more you're cluing in your audience like, hey, you're in the know. You're in that group of people that knows things. And hey, you learned today. That is something that people do enjoy, right? The uh, drawback to it is it requires a more rig rigorous structure to hold your story together. Uh, and it's not as easy to engage with as uh, a pathos story. Now, uh, ethos that is the least taxing to the audience and it's easily followed. Um, and that is when you are appealing to the sense of community, right? So uh, focusing on community appeal or human interest, that that can be uh, a little daunting sometimes because your story's focus can be on the humanity of it and not necessarily the analysis. And also there can be a distancing that people can do or it's like, well, it's not me, it's my community. It's a community I care about, but it's still not me. So usually your, your pathos or pathos, if you wanna to say tomato, tomato, that's typically the easiest to craft, but these are all effective emotional hooks as you're telling your story. So data storytelling, our chat, we're accepting the challenge, right? And I have a great quote from, a, she's a blogger and she teaches on how to um, use data in journalism, right? That is her main focus. Uh, Heather Krauss, good data storytelling combines a deep understanding of data and statistics, data visualization, human cognition, and what makes people attentive and happy, right? Because you got to figure their mental load by the time they get to your meeting, they may already be pretty fried, right? And uh, you have to focus on keeping them engaged. And uh, what I usually like to do is I start with a small fact and then I build on it like, OK, let's let's get your interest going with a small fact that you may not have known. Right. And now we're going to build and build so long as I can see your curiosity is staying peaked. I might not get as far as I want to go, you know, but I'm going to shoot for 90 percent because 90 percent is better than nothing. Right now. Um, why is there a picture of violin with grapes by Picasso here, Julie? If just walk with me for a moment on this, okay? With my my cubism analogy, I love cubism, but what what you'll notice in a lot of cubist paintings, you'll see like a little scrap of newspaper or something really ephemeral in there, and you say, well, why did they do that? And you're not going to find this in a book. This is just kind of Julie talking to you guys right now. When you learn to read, you learn A B C. You learn the alphabet first, and why? because you have to take apart a word before you can put it back together. So that to me is what cubism is really about. And it's also about what, what data science is about. You have to deconstruct something before you put it back together so you can really understand it. It's the beauty of anything. It's not its bits and pieces individually. It's the way it's put together. So data talks, we're gonna listen and we're gonna tell its story, all right? One of the best methods that I enjoy uh, and that you will probably often be tasked with when you are uh, dealing with, you know, you have to do a presentation. How do we do last quarter versus this quarter? 
what did last guy sell last year versus us this year, right? Change over time. Now, as you see, hopefully my graphic is moving for you as well. But change over time, um, it can be, it, the time frame doesn't matter. It can be short, it can be long. But this is something where I really like to incorporate that dynamicism and the movement with the third axis, right? Here we have uh, GDP, right? And the top countries. And you can see China, oh, it's creeping up and then eventually it passes the US. Well, that's an exciting story in and of itself. Isn't that great? And you can do this with so many other visualizations. Scatter plots work well. You can have little dots dancing across the screen. Uh, the only drawback to this is when you give your clients or your your superiors or your powers that be something that's kind of sexy like this with movement, they're going to want it for everything. And it doesn't always apply. So it's something we have to explain. Well, OK, I have the variable of country. I have what the GDPR is. We have time to that's that invisible third axis to get the movement. Something else, uh, this looks a lot like Power BI, right? Um, something like this one you can do in D3 or a lot of other tools too. You can do it in R or Python. But anyway, this looks a lot like Power BI, which is why I like this graphic. Uh, drilling down, if you have multi-layered data and you want to convey a more in-depth understanding of a trend you've observed, uh, this is good. And I love to build this into dash, excuse me, dashboards so that way, the audience can kind of discover the story themselves as they're driving in like, hey, you know, we sold a lot of widgets here. Well, let's look, you know, in particular where that was location wise or whatever it may be. You can let them explore that story themselves. Another one uh, is zooming out. Now, it seems like the opposite of drilling down, but think of. Uh, a local trend that expands globally uh, and then that shows that greater impact or think of your social media, right? You have a friend on Facebook or the grammar or wherever and then they have 10 friends and then it blows out and it can really show, especially when you're looking at this in a graph database, which is a visual I'm going to show in a moment, just how grand the scale is and it can really inspire that wonder and awe in your audience, which is part of the story. So here it is. This is Neo4j. This is a tool that I love. A lot of people aren't that into it, but I am. Graph database, you can have something really small and then imagine as you're expanding, viewing out and out and out to really get that gravitas of the scale of the thing. It's, it's pretty compelling. Now, uh, contrast, that is uh, data sets that if you have a wide range of variables, or more than one data set on a similar or related topic. Highlighting the contrast can really help tell the story to make the narrative more effective. A uh, good example is let's say we have uh, media consumption and a violence uptake. Uh, I'll use an example of let's say the Fast and the Furious movies come out and everybody starts speeding. There are studies on this, you can Google, right? But you could also say video game violence consumption there's actually a violence decline because they're staying home. <laughs> they're staying home being a TV zombie plugged in to their video game so they can't go out and get into trouble. So just a little twist in the logic. And that is contrast is a great way to get your story to help your audience show a conclusion that the readers might find counterintuitive. So that's that's a great tactic. Here's a nice visualization with some contrast. This is um, grocery stores versus bars, which I just think is really, really beautiful. It's not a perfect, perfect example, but um, it's just such a great visualization. I had to keep it in there. Uh, intersections, I could do an entire half hour presentation on intersections, but we're gonna try to keep to the time limit here. And uh, this is good for adding nuance and concepts to situations that the audience already has a decent grasp. What I have visualized here is uh, it's, it's basically an elevated Venn diagram, but there's a problem with Venn diagrams. They don't really scale, right? However, it's attractive and it gets the basic concept across. I'm gonna show you something a little more elevated. Now this will scale and this can make sense if we kind of look to the key on the right, especially let's look at the lower right where we have a Venn diagram 
and that's showing the intersections A, B, C. Boom, right? There's a connection. But then if we look more to the left, we can see more the scale of things of how those relate. But when you're explaining this to an audience, that can be really overwhelming. So you need something more simple in your narrative, a simple diagram and a really powerful story about how they go together. Another diagram that I love, when I look at this, I say, well, this is as clear as summer sun because I'm a data scientist. It's a correlation matrix and the size of the dots relate to the size of the correlation and the colors relate to if it's positive or negative. And those boxes are clusters. Now, if I show this to a CEO or somebody who isn't looking at data day in and day out, that's confusing. So again, that's why you need the story to describe the narrative. This visualization is great for me when I'm figuring things out, but a basic scatter plot showing clusters, that's a lot clearer to a broader audience factors. Um, this is uh, actually a craft calculator designed by Blackburn Labs, uh, but there are a lot of different factors when you're figuring out, well, what should I be charging an hour or what am I actually making an hour when I create a project? Because I have materials, I have my time, you know, and whatever overhead may be. Maybe they charge me a little bit when I sell a product on XYZ website. So the important thing really to remember with factors is moderators, mediators, confounders, they're all just ways that variables relate to each other. And this can lead researchers down a rabbit hole if you're not really careful with logic pitfalls. I'm going to do a quick aside before I uh, tell you how to tell a story with an outlier. Logic train, okay? And I have a quote, correlation does not equal causation, said basically every statistician ever, okay? So if you need to drum that into your mind if it isn't there already, and, and a good example is, let's say we could tell a story of like, well, sunny days cause more homicides. And it's like, well, no. <laughs> you have to take pause and ask, well, why? And how does that make sense? Or ice cream sales lead to more homicides. Well, it's like, well, yes. You know, it's like there are more ice cream sales on a sunny day, right? But what, what it really comes down to is you can see from my little flow diagram on sunny days, ice cream sales go up, yes. And people go out more, so then they get into more trouble and there are more homicides. Ah, there's the flow, right? People swim more, so then they drown more, right? So then if you look at the wheel here for incorrect logic versus correct logic, ice cream sales, no, that, that's not leading to the higher murder rate. Even though those two single points of data may seem to be connected where the truth is, the missing variable, that missing link was the temperature is going up. Ice cream sales go up. And then in a completely different stream, the murder rate also goes up. Now, I love outliers as a data scientist, because if you're telling a story, it's really easy. <laughs> it's easy to visualize and it's easy to explain. Do you need a lot of explanation on this visual I have here? No other rich Western country comes close to homicides with gun violence than the United States. You'll see a very similar graphic to where they uh, will do it by population, they will do it by uh, wealth and a, a lot of other variables. But basically when that lingering thing of, well, how many homicides are there with gun violence, we will always stand alone as the United States, we're number one. Uh, and and it's, it's very powerful. So that tells a story, right? That single point standing alone tells a story. And what's nice about it is, is you're trying to craft a visual for stakeholders and you're really, this is a great example for one of those beginner to get your curiosity peaked before moving on. Um, outliers are awesome for that. And I do have to make sure I'm not going too long. Communicating findings, what I'm going to say is just be aware of the cognitive load theory. Um, it's not enough to be right. You have to just be, you also have to be effective. And remember by the time they get to your meeting, they could already be pretty saturated with information. And something that I think is really important is be sure to include your uncertainty because things like margin of error, confidence intervals, limitations in your data, your sample size, your ana analysis methods, there are, all, there are always holes. You're going to get tasked with giving a bulletproof story. It, it doesn't exist, but these are dragons that we can take on. 
Okay, and I have to include Car Carl Sagan's happy smiling face, but yeah, just remember extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So, you know, you have to make sure that you're using enough data and you're telling the story effectively. Um, people see things that they are familiar with. So we have to be careful as we're, you know, you don't want to exploit the selection bias. This is my last one, okay? Poking holes in logic. I love this quote by Neil deGrasse Tyson. Two examples of deeply flawed logic. You don't have dandruff. Why do you use dandruff shampoo? We don't have any, many cases of COVID-19. Why do we shut down? Why do we keep our state borders closed? Isn't that perfect? That perfect little snippet of a story. You've used shampoo. You can relate to that. That makes sense. And he is such a great presenter. And, you know, CEOs and surgeons, they have to have confidence to the point of perceived arrogance. And it's good you know, data scientists, I have a lot of quotes from astrophysicists. We have to question to the point of perceived deprecation. Thank you for listening and going on me with this journey. <laughs> okay, and I see uh, Joe Devine has popped up in my little corner. I think I made it. Yes, I got a couple minutes to spare. And uh, thanks for going along with me, guys. I love talking about data stories and data narratives. It is possibly my favorite part of data science. That was so interesting. It really, it really took us along a, long, a long, nice long, journey. Thank you so much. That Thank was you. <laughs> so easy to follow. Okay. Very good. Do we have any questions? Do I have time? I think I have two minutes. I don't see any questions in the in the chat, but that's what you should put them if you have them. Um, I've got a couple of questions for sure. Okay. I don't see a lot of storytelling in organizations, and I'm wondering, do you have any ideas or recommendations for how to create a culture where storytelling becomes part of the fabric of, of how things get done? I think the best way is really to just have an advocate who leads by example. You know, you need to have an evangelist who inspires. Uh, if you can tap into that talent, that is something that that people will want to copy in a good way. And honestly, I mean, everybody needs to keep their skills sharp. And there is an attitude, I think, among, you know, BI and data science where it has to be stats. It has to be bulletproof. I have to nail this down. And there is an element of that in our industry. But you also, you know, just like Neil deGrasse Tyson was saying, you can't just be right. You have to be effective. If you can't tug at those heartstrings and make people feel emotions toward your story, you aren't going to get action. So would you rather tell a positive story or a negative story? <laughs> it depends on which one I think I can sell more because a negative story can give you righteous anger and drive action that way. As in like, hey, have you seen competitor B? They're kicking our ass. We're better than them. Don't you realize that we're better than them? Don't you want a better life for your families? You know what I mean? <laughs> Don't you want to keep moving through the ranks? Let's do it. We can take them on. That's that's a story you can tell too. Yeah, absolutely. Have you seen examples in the past? I mean, you've been working with data for a while. Have you seen examples where somebody um, should abuse a story and they didn't? And you know, they, so really the, the best cause of action didn't happen because they failed to use this technique? Yes, absolutely. I can think of um, a really talented data scientist, but he was a little socially awkward and he didn't have that psychological safety of being in a team where he felt that he didn't have to prove himself. So he often would just have lines of Linux flying across the screen saying, behold, there it is. And it made no sense to anybody. Or as if he just had, you need a little bit of courage there to say, this is the findings, you may not like them, and here's the story around it. You know, here is where we as a company failed, or here is where we can succeed again. That would have been far more powerful in that narrative than just allowing the data to fly and letting them draw whatever conclusions they will. Yeah, I can see that. Mm -hmm. I I think, what about on the positive side? Is there uh, an example where somebody was able to convince people to make a real difficult decision or a real expensive decision uh, <laughs> by using storytelling? That's that's a great question of, you know, a really expensive decision. <laughs> that's, that's wonderful. I think that 
there are a lot of success stories where when you're appealing to that pathos, you know, where people are saying, that's me. I feel that because it's me. Um, great entrepreneurs. Uh, what's her name? She did Spanx. You know, she has a great story around why she created that, you know, and um if you follow her on LinkedIn, she is awesome. Even just little memes to keep you engaged, you know, about what's going on in her business and great little stories too. And it keeps you wanting to go back and check in and be emotionally invested and come back for more. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else have a question? Well, I can't thank you enough, Julie. Really, thank you for sharing this with us today. Really appreciate it. Uh, on behalf you. of Tech Collective and everybody on the call, thanks for taking your time to put this together for us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. It was a pleasure to present it. All right, guys. Thank All you right. very Take much. Care. Bye. Bye, Bye. Thanks, Julie. Bye. <laughs>